So, uh, Congressman. Uh, Mark, thank you, and thank you for including me in this wonderful forum today. Uh, frankly, I don't know of anyone who is more knowledgeable or more honest about the subject of immigration than Mark Krikoyan. He also helps keep others honest as well. Uh, which uh, and provides a real service in that way, too. Uh, let me sort of apologize to my co-panelists up here at the outset, because my prepared remarks are probably a little on the long side, and uh, so I'm going to focus a little bit on DACA, too, as John is in just a minute. But appreciate their forbearance in that regard. And then also, as Mark said, unfortunately, my new committee responsibilities require me to I uh, have a meeting uh, shortly after I finish here, so I'm being pulled by one committee to another. Uh, but let me go on and start, and then again, I uh, appreciate you all being here and appreciate the interest in the subject. And, and I just can't resist saying at the outset, too, that I don't know of any subject today that Congress deals with uh, that is more sensitive, uh, more emotional, more controversial, or more intractable uh, than the subject of immigration. But it's important because it absolutely impacts every aspect of every American's daily life. And that's one reason we're here, and that's one reason we need to uh, devote a lot of time and attention to the subject. Well, from the outset, the Obama administration has ignored U.S. immigration laws, and it has imposed its own immigration agenda on the American people without respecting the legislative process. This became abundantly clear in the summer of 2010 when a memo written by top U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service officials was leaked to the media. The USCIS memo suggested that the Department of Homeland Security take steps to legalize millions of illegal immigrants through its administrative powers. It specifically stated that the Department of Homeland Security could, quote, grant deferred action to an unrestricted number of unlawfully present individuals, end quote. And it suggested that it grant deferred action to illegal immigrants who would be eligible for relief under the DREAM Act, end quote, and those who have lived in the U.S. since some particular date. After that memo was leaked, I asked USCIS about it. USCIS told the Immigration Subcommittee staff that they had rejected many of the suggestions in the memo and that the memo was simply a, quote, brainstorming exercise, end quote. But we all know that these memos were drafted in the context of great political pressure by the administration to legalize countless illegal immigrants through administrative action. And in June 2012, despite their reassurances, the administration announced an administrative amnesty for illegal immigrants who had come to the U.S. before the age of 16, some of whom would be covered if the DREAM Act was enacted. The program would be called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. But this was a shock only if you had taken the president at his word on this subject. Because on March 28, 2011, President Obama said, quote, with respect to the notion that I can just suspend deportations through executive order, that's just not the case, because there are laws on the books that Congress has passed. The executive branch's job is to enforce and implement those laws. There are enough laws on the books by Congress that are very clear in terms of how we have to enforce our immigration system that for me to simply through executive order, ignore those congressional mandates would not conform with my appropriate role as president, end quote. Just over a year later, the president not only had ignored the intent of immigration law, but also had broken his specific commitment to the American people. Based on the president's record, the first lesson we can learn from the DACA implementation is that you simply can't always believe what the president says. That is worth remembering when considering how a large-scale amnesty could be implemented. For example, to be granted DACA, the illegal immigrant must meet the following basic requirements, and I'll run through them here real quickly. Have come to the United States under the age of 16, have continuously resided in the United States for at least five years preceding June 15, 2012, and to have been president of the United States on that date is currently in school, has graduated from high school, has obtained a general education development certificate, or is an honorably discharged veteran of the Coast Guard or Armed Forces of the United States, has not been convicted of a felony offense, a significant misdemeanor offense, multiple misdemeanor offenses, or otherwise does not pose a threat to national security or public safety, and is not above the age of 30. After Secretary Napolitano announced DACA, it became clear that there was little, if any, planning in place regarding the actual implementation of DACA and the processing of DACA applications. 
DACA was announced on a Friday, of course, and the following Monday, the heads of USCIS, ICE, and Customs and Border Protections held a stakeholder conference call during which USCIS Director Mayorkas began by stating that they were, quote, not in the position to answer many questions about the process, end quote. A month later, at a July 13, 2012 briefing by John Sandwick, counselor to the Secretary of DHS, Immigration Subcommittee counsels were told that there were a lot of questions to which the administration was not going to be able to give detailed answers. Question after question were met with the words, that has not yet been decided. Nevertheless, on August 15, 2012, USCIS began accepting DACA applications. As of December 13, 2012, USCIS had received 368,000 DACA applications and approved 103,000. While 12,000 had been rejected, that does not mean they were denied. USCIS refuses to release the number of denied DACA applications. If history is any indication, DACA will be accompanied by significant levels of fraud. Remember that it is estimated that nearly two thirds of the applications for special agricultural workers in the 1986 amnesty were fraudulent, two thirds. USCIS lists the types of documents that are accepted as proof of each of the requirements a DACA applicant must meet. For instance, as proof of identity, USCIS accepts a passport, national identity document from the applicant's home country, birth certificate with photo identification, school or military ID with photo, or any US government immigration document with a name and photo. As evidence that a DACA applicant came to the United States prior to their 16th birthday, USCIS accepts a school record from a U.S. school, travel records, or medical records. But there is no requirement that these records be certified or validated. And we all know that identity documents can easily be forged. Nowadays, they can be made on a home computer. And USCIS admits that they do not have the resources to check whether documents are authentic. Yet according to USCIS, the documents required as evidence of DACA eligibility must be independently verifiable. Of course, they are not doing that. But this process also must be cost neutral. So fraud prevention and detection actions that are expensive or time consuming or that unduly impact USCIS's other responsibilities will simply not be utilized. Equally as troubling, as that DS, DHS officials have consistently made clear to immigration subcommittee councils that if individuals commit fraud in the application process, DH, DHS retains the flexibility to decide whether or not to prosecute fraud for fraud crimes. You can guess how many will be prosecuted. Not surprisingly, DHS refuses to answer requests for statistics about the fraud found in DACA applications. Furthermore, the administration claims that DACA provides no path to citizenship, but advanced parole is a loophole in DACA that again contradicts the administration's reassurances. Advanced parole is permission granted to qualified foreign nationals to allow them to re-enter the United States after temporarily traveling abroad. When I asked Secretary Napolitano at a hearing last July of the House Judiciary Committee whether DACA recipients would be eligible for advanced parole, she indicated that yes, there may be cases in which it is granted. And once granted advanced parole, a DACA recipient can adjust immigration status to lawful permanent residence status either through a family or employment-based immigration petition. One other result of the Obama administration's immigration policies, including DACA, is that immigration agencies that have historically been enforcement-based are now being turned into amnesty facilitation agencies. Take CBP. Under DACA procedures, when CBP officers encounter an illegal immigrant who appears to qualify for DACA at a CBP checkpoint on the U.S. interior, the officer cannot take the individual into custody. Instead, the officer must give the illegal immigrant a letter outlining DACA and stating that the individual should contact USCIS to apply for it. And if an ICE agent in the field encounters an illegal immigrant who appears to qualify for a DACA, the ICE agent is prohibited from taking the individual into custody. The agent must notify the individual either verbally or in writing that the individual should contact USCIS to apply for DACA. 
From June to October 2012, as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I sent 11 letters, some in conjunction with Senator Grassley, the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, to DHS and its immigration agency components, USCIS and ICE, regarding DACA and its implementation. I received only one formal response to these letters. I understand we've been told through staff um, court communications that the White House specifically told DHS and its components not to respond to letters from members of Congress. The DACA process is President Obama's test run for a mass amnesty. Given the lack of detail, transparency, and attention to fraud prevention, such a mass amnesty will provide legal status and ultimately voting privileges to potentially millions of unqualified illegal immigrants. This cannot be good for our country, our democratic institutions, or our rule of law. As the facts continue to be revealed, I believe Congress and the American people will hold the Obama administration accountable. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, Congressman. Um, you have to run, right? I'm afraid so, I do. Okay, no, thank you very much. Good to be with you. Yeah. Yeah.